Hello, everybody. Few questions in order to better understand my audience. How many of you are developers? Hey. Java developers, .NET. And how many of you are security professionals working with developers? Excellent. The reality is that developers have not learned about secure coding or crypto in school. At university level, secure coding or software security is not part of the curriculum in most universities. At the same time, cyber attacks are a real and growing threat to businesses. An increasing number of these attacks takes place at the application layer. The best defense for this is to develop applications where the security has been incorporated in. Last, top 10 proactive controls. Consider security as part of the software development cycle. In this presentation, we are going to go through the security controls that you as developers can use while writing your software. And for each of these controls, you are going to learn of which of the most common vulnerabilities you can prevent. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Katie Anton. I come from a software development background where I have led in creating created teams of developers. I currently work as application security at Barcode, where I help developers around the world to help secure their software. The OASP top 10 risks is by far the most cited OASP document. This presentation is going to be uh, based on this table version, the 2013, not the, the release candidate, because this version has been out there for almost four years. But how many of you have tried, starting from this list, to secure your software and use this while writing the code. As I mentioned, I previously worked, uh, in my previous life, I was head of development. I was working with development teams. And our responsibility was to deliver software to retailers. We have every two weeks releases. And in each release, the entire focus was on delivering new functionality to our customers. And as you know, as developers, when a developer starts writing the code for a new functionality or for a bug fix, its entire focus is on writing the code for that functionality. And it's very difficult to ask a developer to think about OS injection and how to prevent it, SQL injection and how to prevent it. So for me, the question was, what are the security techniques that we, as developers, can use every day while writing the code? Without being security experts, that can help to prevent this. The most common vulnerabilities found in software applications. Because when this occur, here are some of the exploits that can take place. Like, for example, talk talk from a SQL injection. Uh, Ashley Madison, a lot of material out there, and I'm going to go through some of it in this presentation. Most of the second do to patch software. Um, a very interesting one that maybe is not that now, which happened in the software that was powering the slot machines in US casinos. And what happened there was that the numbers generated by that software were not random. This meant that it was possible for the attacker to guess them, and this is exactly what happened. The attackers load a sequence of the numbers generated by the software, analyze those, and then predict the next ones in this way, increasing their wins. And the most recent one, which happened this week, um, the data breach into HipChat due to third, uh, vulnerabilities into a third-party library. So as developers, we write applications from enterprise applications, web services, microservices, or even a small website, like this gorgeous little website with balloons and butterflies. Regardless of the size of the application we write, the question is, how can we write it more secure? But where 
do we even start? Well, a good starting point is OWASP, Application Security Verification Standard, or for short, ASVS. This document helps you to choose the appropriate level of security for your own application, where level one is the minimum level. Every application should be verified at level one. Level two is for those applications that in case of a data breach, okay, it's going to be embarrassing. It's going to create a little bit of mess that needs to be cleaned up, but it's not going to be the end of the world. And level three is for those applications that you really do care about those applications that are critical to the business, and in case of a data breach, well, there are going to be serious financial consequences. Those type of applications, they must be verified at level three. And here is an extract of how the verification requirements look into OSP ASVS, where each requirement is clearly marked if it applies to level one, level two, or level three. And I particularly choose the requirements uh, the cryptography requirements were at 7.6. Uh, it actually states that when your software needs random number generators, then you should use the cryptography's module approved random number generators. So if these verification requirements would have been used in the case of the software powering the slot machines, that vulnerability could have been avoided. So we can use OWASP ASVS to choose the appropriate level of security for our own application. From there, extract the requirements and use those requirements further to generate the test cases that can help for us to verify for security early and often. And here, here is our first control. Verify for security early and often. And when we say early and often, we actually mean throughout the software development cycle. Where you can say from the time when you actually write the code, apart from the unit test, you can also have further checks at the code review point. So let's go back to that software that was powering the slot machines. We have used the ASVS. We understand that we need to use an approved algorithm. Once that one is understand at the application level that can get into the check reviews checklist. So now let's suppose that the developer has actually finished to deliver that new functionality and it's about to commit the code. At that point, extra security checks can be done using the pre-commit hooks. Here you can actually check to see if the software that is about to be committed hasn't got um, passwords, secret keys, tokens. You can also add checks for deprecated algorithms like MD5 and for uh, dangerous functions like eval or exec. I actually had a developer that kept committing into the production code, into the code that would be, would get delivered into production, var dump and print R. Not only that would create bugs in the production, but also disclose information. The way we sorted this one was to actually add those functions into a list of forbidden functions uh, at the pre-commit point. So now let's suppose that the code, it has been committed, it is now into the main development branch, the branch that is going to be prepared for the release. At this point, you can have, apart from the normal regression test, you can also have the security check tests. Uh, and this is the point where you can actually use the test generated from the ASVS. Furthermore, you can automate those. For example, using OASP Zap in headless mode. You can further integrate those into your tools like Jenkins and make them part of your continuous integration and continuous delivery. So control number one helps you from the start, not as an afterthought, to prevent all the OWASP top 10 risks. This control gives you a very nice framework where rather than starting with security uh, at the end as an afterthought, you start with the requirements from the beginning. And instead of testing for security at the end of a project or project phase, 
you automate testing and make it part of your continuous integration and continuous delivery. Great, so let's see what else can we do. SQL injection 2017, and there are plenty out there in production. The problem with SQL injection is that untrusted input is executed as part of the SQL command. The defense for this, control number two, parameterized queries. The parameterized queries prevent untrusted input from being interpreted as part of the SQL command. So let's see how we should do it. So, and this is what is for .NET, yes, we use string format. We separate the input from the command. And my favorite, the Java. How many of you think that this is the correct way to do it? Okay, I'm just checking to see that everybody is still awake after the lovely lunch. This is not the correct way to do it. And the underlying issue here is, at the end of the day, you end up with one string after the string replace. The underlying issue is that the one string contains both the command and the input. And the SQL parser cannot differentiate between of what's an input and what is the actual command. The correct way to do it is to separate the two. And we do this by writing the SQL command and having some placeholders and then using specific commands to bind those variables to the placeholders. This is a very nice way to tell the SQL parser, by the way, here is my command and there are some placeholders in it. And here are the variables to use for those placeholders. In this way, the SQL parser knows what, what are the variables and from that point on, it treats them like simple strings. So the actual defense happens at the SQL parser level. And for this reason, uh, control number two, this control of parameterized queries is the best defense against SQL injection. So using control number two to parameterize queries, we can prevent injection. Most types anyway, and I'm going to go further in this presentation into an example uh, where this control cannot prevent. Great, the next one is uh, cross-site scripting. And here is just a simple example of, inje uh, any of injection payload. Now the cross-site scripting, uh, it's capable of actually from a simple cross-site scripting to bring down uh, systems, servers within networks. And it was a case like this in 2010, where from a simple cross-site scripting, uh, servers within the Apache network were shut down. <clears throat> the defense for this is control number three. Encode your output. Encode it before sending it to the parser. It's also important to consider contextual encoding. And this, what this means is that you apply the right method for the right context where your dynamic variable is. So for, your, for example, if your dynamic data is into an HTML, then you are going to use encode for HTML. If your dynamic data is placed into a JavaScript content, then you are going to use encode for JavaScript context. This can be quite complex and overall overwhelming for a developer to, to do it correctly. So the best way is to use a library that has been already designed for this pur purpose. In the case of Java applications, the base library out there is the OSP Java encoder. Uh, it's a simple, has no dependencies, and it is regularly updated. In the case of .NET application, the best uh, library out there is the anti-cross-site scripting library. Now, sometimes I'm told that the .NET frameworks have already a uh, default encoding, which is true, it has, but there is a difference between the default encoding of the .NET framework and the anti-cross-site scripting library. How many of you knows the difference? Um, so the main difference between the two types of encoding is that the TIFA encoding is based on blacklist and as security professionals, we don't like blacklists because it is possible to bypass, it, bypass them using canonical representation attacks. The anti cross scripting library is based on whitelist. What this means, it has a whitelist of uh, defined of characters. Anything outside that list is automatically encoding. For this reason, from version 4.5, the anti cross scripting is part of the framework. You still need to change your web config 
to have it in place, but it is part of the framework uh, by default. So contextually encoding all your output prevents injection and cross site scripting. What about the input? For this, we have control number four, validate all the input. And when we refer to all the input, we refer to actually all the data that hits our enters the application. And this can be from uh, variables that comes from post and get, including hidden fields. File uploads, HTTP headers, cookies, including data from the database, because when we validate also the data that comes from the database, we can prevent, for example, second order SQL injection. How many of you have heard of second order SQL injection? Phew, great. For the most majority of you that haven't heard, I'm going to go through a very simple example. The second order SQL injection works when the injection payload stays dormant in the database and the exploit actually occurs when it is used in other parts of the software. So now let's suppose that we have a simple form and we register a user. We already have a user, John, but now we register another user, John, single code, dash, dash. This value is going to become the SQL injection payload when used in other parts of the software. So let's suppose that we go, for example, to change the password. And the SQL injection for changing the password is going to become from changing the password from, from the, for the initial user to actually changing the password for a different user. In this way, we can say that we have successfully changed the password for another modified data for another user, and we have performed a second order SQL injection. The defense against this is to validate the data from, uh, that comes from your database as well. So validating all the input, including the one that comes from the database, can prevent injection, cross-site scripting, and unvalidated redirects and forwards. So let's go back to our gorgeous website, and let's see by now which are the controls that we have put in place. So we have a way to verify for security early and often. We parameterize the queries by binding the variables. We contextually encode all the output and validate all the input, including the one that comes from the database. So let's see what else we can do. Our website, like many applications out there, has a section that is available to everybody and a section that is restricted to certain users. For this, we have control number five identity and authentication controls. Now when it comes to authentication, this can be a complex security control. In this session, I'm just going to go through some of the best practices, like for example, implement a secure password storage, use multi-factor authentication, have in place a secure password recovery mechanism, and transmit any sensitive data via TLS, ideally 1.2. Apart from that, and it's also important to have in place well-designed error messages. Next, I'm going to go a little bit more detail for each of these. Now, when it comes to password storage, we want to make it as difficult as possible for the attacker that in case that the database is leaked, it's difficult for them to get the actual password. Um, it's important to use strong cryptographic algorithms and the ones that are recommended out there are pass uh, password-based key derivation function to bcrypt and scrypt. Now, also, when it comes to the actual password, the latest NIST guidelines, which are at the moment in draft mode as in, of April 2017, recommends to have a minimum of eight characters. And it's important to actually use all the characters, including spaces. One thing that you need to be aware is about the maximum length of the password. Now, if the password is way too long, then it, there is a risk of denial of service. Apart from that one, there are some certain algorithms, like Bcrypt, which automatically tr truncates anything that is over 72 bytes. Ideally, in this case, you would use a modern hash, like SHA-512, uh, because what this does, it actually prevents denial of service of service and also solves the problem of truncation. So if we are to recap, when it comes to a secure password storage, you should use a modern SHA to protect against denial of service or truncation. You should use a user-specific salt 
strong cryptographic algorithms, or like, for example, password-based key derivation function to BigCrypt or Rescript, and a second factor, ideally. Now, when it comes to the second factor authentication, um, it should be either uh, a dedicated app or an actual key. It's worth noting that the latest guidelines from NIST actually do not recommend SMS as a second factor, and they actually plan to ban it. But if we implement a secure password storage, it is important to be consistent and do it so through the entire software. And this is an example from Ashley Madison website where they actually have used a pretty good password uh, crypt uh, cryptographic algorithm, Bcrypt. But what they did next was that the same password that the users would enter was used to create a fast login key. And that was stored using the deprecated MD5. Once this was understood, it was very easy for the, the attackers to crack those passwords. Uh, about 11 million passwords were cracked, were uh, disclosed due to this flaw in their software. Now, when it comes to a forgot password, a good design workflow will ask some security questions. Then we'll send a user a generated token. We'll verify the token within the same session and allow the user to change the password. This might not be the perfect workflow, but it is a multi-factor one because first ask some security questions, something you know, and then send the user a token to a device, something you own. Also, error messages are very important. So it is important to have in place well-designed error messages that doesn't disc disclose information about your users. And here is an example of how not to do it. And you can find like this plenty out there on the internet if you look. Um, where the visitor is actually presented with a message if the user exists in the database and a different message if the user does not exist in the database. So the correct way to do it is to actually use the same HTTP header, 200 OK, and same HTML message in both scenarios, if the user exists and if the user does not exist in your database. So like I mentioned, the subject of authentication is a complex one. In this session, I'm, I've just been through some points, like for example, how to make it harder for the attacker with a, a strong password storage, how to protect the identities of the users with a well-designed uh, password recovery mechanism and error messages. Now, these are not the only controls, but it's a good way to pre prevent a broken authentication and session management. Great, so let's see. By now, we have discussed about who is accessing the page. What about of what pages are, are accessed? For this, we have control number six, implement um, ac appropriate access controls. Now, when it comes to access controls, this can be complex security controls. In this session, I'm just going, uh, the ideal way to deal with this, because of their complexity, is to actually bring in and use a framework that is already designed with these principles in mind. Uh, and using a framework and using it correctly can help you to prevent insecure direct object reference and missing function level access controls. What else can we do? What about the data? For this, we have control number seven, protect data both at rest and in transit. Now, when it comes to data in transit, the best protection out there is still HTTPS, which helps with confidentiality, in integrity, and authenticity. Uh, the HTTPS does not cover all the man-in-the-middle attacks. So for this, ideally, you would also use an extra header, strict transport security header. How many of you are actually using this header? Few, great. So this is a very easy uh, thing to add to the, your application. You can either add it back code or server configuration. What this header do is that this header is downloaded by the application onto a client server. So it is a browser standard. But from that point on, the communication between the browser and the remote server, the client browser and the remote server, is always done via the secure channel, HTTPS. Now, when it comes to data at rest, the, um, the best cryptographic algorithm is still AES, and you should also have in place a secure key management and adequate access controls and auditing in place. That is for managing the keys for encrypting the data. 
So using control number seven to protect the data both at rest and in transit, you can prevent sensitive data exposure. Another thing that we can do is to have in place logging and intrusion detection. Now logging should not be used to debugging or troubleshooting only. It can also be used for application monitoring, compliance monitoring, and intrusion detection. And having in place a well-designed logging mechanism coupled with a good detection one, detection mechanism can help to prevent all the other top 10 risks. Now, <clears throat> let's see what else can we do. Now, starting from the scratch, to write a new security control every time we write a new application or a new web service. Not only that is time consuming, but it can also lead to security design flaws and implementation flaws. Think, for example, access controls. These are not uh, the simplest thing. These are complex uh, design-heavy security controls. You don't want to do this from the scratch or even a library to protect against uh, cross-site scripting is not the simplest thing to do from the scratch. So a way to deal with this is to leverage security frame, uh, frameworks and libraries that ha have security embedded in. For this, we have control number nine, leverage security frameworks and library. So for example, we can choose a framework that has well-designed access controls in place and CSRF protection. We can bring in a library to protect against cross-site scripting and uh, bring in an ORM for SQL injection. But there is a problem out there. And the problem is that there is a lot of software with vulnerable components. In fact, in the case of Java application, 97% of Java applications have a list of one component with at least one vulner known vulnerability. Now, when we say known vulnerability, we actually refer to those vulnerabilities that have been published out there uh, on the internet, available for everyone to see in uh, databases of vulnerabilities. And the main problem is that the proprietary code is entangled with the code from the third-party libraries. This makes it difficult to upgrade and almost impossible to replace that library. So let's consider the following structure. So you have our own nice code and now we bring a library and that depends on another library and depends on another library. And now we start implementing that functionality into our own code. So implement it into a module and then in another module. Soon enough, the code from the third party library touches 100 or even of points in your own, or even thousands of points in your own software. In the case of cross-site scripting, it can easily get into thousands of points where the third party library touches your own code. And now a vulnerability is reported somewhere into a component of a component. So the question is, how can we protect our own software? But how to understand if the vulnerability reported in that library actually affects our software? Because if it doesn't affect it, we, don't, we need to do nothing. But if it affects, then how does it affect it and what are the controls that we need to put in place? The problem is that just by bringing in components, third-party libraries, but not incorporate them, nor manage them appropriately, the software is at risk of being breached through its vulnerable components. At the end of the day, an attacker would not spend uh, any time to try to break into your nicely secure software. When they can do the same thing, with much less effort using a vulnerability that exists in one of your components incorporated into your software. So the question is, when we bring the third party libraries, how can we make it, how, what's the best way to deal with this, how to incorporate them? Well, a good starting for the answer to this question is Robert C. Martin's book, Clean Code. How many of you have heard of Clean Code? Also, Uncle Bob. So what he says there is that when uh, 
you wrapping an API is a best practice uh, because you minimize your dependencies. Not only this, but if you want to replace it, you can do it without much penalty. So these are some benefits from a software design point of view. There are further benefits from a security point of view. Like I men mentioned, replacing or updating is a very important one. In the world of security, there is a continuous cat and mouse chase between the developers and the attackers. The developers write a library, attackers break it. Developers fix it, attackers break it again. So it's important to have this flexibility to actually upgrade them or even replace them if needs be. By wrapping a library, you also are in a position to expose into your code only the functionality that you need and hide unwanted behavior. In this way, you reduce your attack surface. Now, if it's a vulnerability is discovered into your third-party library, then you have that wrapper, that document of what you use and how you use it. And how that, that helps you a lot to understand of where to put the controls and which controls to put in place. Plus, uh, you don't, in the case of a wrapper, you end up from to reducing from a thousand of points where the code can touch to only one point, the wrapper. So you end up with only one point where you need to apply your control. Now, depending on the complexity of the third-party libraries, you have several software design patterns. You can use uh, a wrapper, for example, if you just want to expose into your code the functionality that you need and want to hide unwanted behavior. In the case of <clears throat> uh, libraries that provide you the, a different interface from what your software needs, then you can use the adapter. And in the case of complex systems, then you can use a facade. A facade a design pattern actually helps you to simplify the um, <coughs> connection between your own software and the complex system. And as you can see in the facade, you, in the facade class, you actually have one point where in case you need to apply extra controls, that's your point where you can apply them easily. So in the case of Java, in the case of applications, large applications in particular, the number of third-party libraries can be large, from tens to hundreds. To do it manually, to manage those manually, it's uh, impossible. So you need to automate those. Uh, you can use this one, like us, oh, this dependency check, which has, uh, uh, which at the moment supports .NET and Java languages. So if we are to wrap up, when bringing in third-party libraries, it's important to use from trusted sources. When you incorporate them, it's important to encapsulate them. So you expose into your software only the functionality that you need and you hide unwanted behavior. In this way, you reduce your attack servers. It's also important to verify for those often and update them or even replace them if needs be. So in using this control to leverage security frameworks and libraries, but more importantly, using it in a correct manner that ensures that your software is and stays secure can help to prevent all the OWASP top 10 risks. And the last control is uh, error and exception handling. Now, when it comes to error, it is important to have a centralized to manage the errors and exception handling in a centralized manner. It's important to give the user enough information about what to do next, but don't link, link information about your uh, own application. Now, when you design your uh, errors and exception handling, you can think as an analogy to the coordinates. By themselves, a latitude and longitude have no value but put them together and they can pinpoint the exact location on Earth. The same is valid for error messages. One error message at a time might mean nothing, but one of the things an attacker would do is poke around the application, see which are all the error messages linked by the software, aggregate them, and then extract information about your application, business logic, or its structure. So having in place, um, well-designed error messages where an exception handling that doesn't disclose information about your application can 
prevent all the osteoptin risks. So let's go back to our website and let's see by now which are the controls that we have put in place. So we have a way to verify for security early and often. We parameterize the queries by binding the variables. We contextually encode all the data we validate all the input, including the one from the database. We implement appropriate authentication and access controls and we protect the data both at rest and in transit. On top of that, we have uh, adequate logging uh, and intrusion detection in place. For complex security controls, we leverage security frameworks and libraries, and we have in place well-designed error messages. Using these controls, while you write the code on a consistent ma uh, manner, can help you to prevent the most common vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities found in software applications. Now, what I would like you to take home are the controls that you can use in implementing your own software project. And use them consistently while writing the code. I think it is important to remember that an attacker needs only one flaw to bring down an entire system. So consistency is equally important to using them in the first place. Now, if you'd like to know more about this project, you can actually visit the project page, which is the OSP Proactive Controls page. <clears throat> I think uh, and from there, you can actually dive deeper into each of the controls to see how you can use them for your own projects. Also, I think it's worth noting that at the moment we are working on the next version. And if you have feedback that you want to give to us, please feel free, either you reach me at the end of this, uh, after this uh, presentation, or you can subscribe to the project list. Thank you very much.